Good evening. Good evening. On this fourth evening of our Honolulu closed class, we will take up the subject of healing. Our interest, of course, is in the subject of spiritual healing. But because there is so much misunderstanding of certain terms that are used in the metaphysical and spiritual world, I want to go all the way back to the beginning of the subject of healing. First of all, there is physical healing, that is healing on the physical level of life, healing that is accomplished through medicine, surgery, and uh, other material means. And sometimes metaphysicians are apt to very disdainfully deny such things. And this is unwise. As a matter of absolute truth, there is but one consciousness, and it is spiritual. It is more than spiritual, it is spirit itself. But in the different stages of consciousness, we find one called material, a material state of consciousness. There is no material consciousness, there is a material state of consciousness. And then there is the mental. There is no mental consciousness, but there is a mental state of consciousness. On the material plane, or material state of consciousness, there are laws of matter. And as long as one lives on that plane, those laws are important. They cannot be ignored. They hold the issues of life and death on that material plane. Let no one deny that aspirin has healed millions of headaches, that surgery has prolonged the human sense of life, that some medicines and diets have given uh, not only health, greater longevity, but actual peace of mind as well to those on the physical or material level of consciousness. Somewhere back in the last century, the world moved, or at least part of it, into a greater awareness of a mental level of consciousness. Now up until that time, the body being physical or material, for the belief of that time, all remedies were material, and the causes of disease were material, so that a doctor looked no further than the body itself for symptoms and for healing agencies. When uh, the middle of the 19th century brought to light the fact that there are mental causes for physical diseases, 
a new world of materia medica opened. Before this happened, Christian science and unity grew rapidly and uh, were known for their great healing works. At first, Materia Medica fought the practice of Christian science and did everything within its power using the full influence of the American Medical Association to prevent the practice of uh, metaphysical healing, then called mental healing. But one by one, state legislatures and foreign countries legalized the practice of Christian science after sufficient proof had been established that this healing agency could be relied upon and uh, that it was not dangerous to the welfare of the world. It was a long and it was a hard battle. Naturally, it was ridiculed that uh, there could be such a thing as a mental cause for a physical disease and equally so that there could be a mental remedy for a physical disease. When the battle was fought in the Massachusetts legislature, one doctor went so far as to say that if it could be proven that one case of leprosy had been healed by this means, that he would withdraw all objection to metaphysical healing in the state of Massachusetts, and very promptly it was proven a physician was brought from St. Louis who himself had been healed of leprosy after his associates had diagnosed the case and had arranged for him to be sent to Louisiana, to the leprosy colony there. And he had not only his own evidence, but those of three doctors in St. Louis with the diagnosis before and after. That's how it was legalized in that state. <clears throat> there are interesting stories about the struggle in those days, but it was all centered around one thing, the complete conviction on the part of Materia Medica that there was no mental cause for a physical disease and that there was no mental remedy for a physical disease. Well, of course, as time went on, all of that was disproved, and uh, the practice of Christian science was legalized, and then quickly followed unity. Unity began its uh, ministry in 1892. Christian science began in 1866 and officially probably 1875 on a recognized scale, and then unity in 1892. And it, of course, came under the protection of the law as was now in effect. Soon after that, the New Thought Movement started, and it also uh, had as its foundation mental healing, the mental healing of physical disease. In the years that have passed, Christian science flourished to the point where there were 11,000 authorized practitioners listed in its journal and probably 40 to 50,000 not uh, registered as official full-time practitioners, but 11,000 who gave their full-time and derived their full income from the practice. I don't suppose the number in unity is known. I don't know that it's ever been made known, but unity also flourished throughout the world, and uh, differing somewhat from Christian science and its mode of practice, 
they maintain a healing body in Kansas City consisting, I believe, of 100 practitioners called Silent Unity. And people in any part of the world are at liberty to write there, telegraph there, or telephone there for help. And uh, one or more practitioners is assigned to them to continue the treatment until the healing takes place or until the patient uh, asks that no further work be conducted. Now, as time went on, Materia Medica could not ignore these healings and uh, as was natural they adopted it and you now find mental healing of physical disease in materia medica under the name of psychosomatic medicine and to some extent in psychology and in, to some extent in psychiatry it is now recognized that the mind can produce disease on the body. Ultimately, it will uh, be discovered that there is no other way for disease to enter the body except through the mind. That is the next step for Materia Medica to acknowledge, that the body in and of itself has no intelligence. The body in and of itself couldn't tell whether you are sitting in a bathtub or standing out in the rain getting wet. In the bathtub you won't catch cold, but if you're out in the rain you might. It's the same water, but uh, the belief about it is different. <clears throat> or you might be sitting in a draft and catch cold, but if you were out on the street you wouldn't. It's the same air, it's the same body, the day is coming rapidly when Materia Medica itself realizes the ridiculousness of uh, the body in and of itself catching a disease or a body being ill without the active cooperation of the mind. And uh, it is for that reason that I have no doubt that it is only a question of time, and not a very long time, when all disease will be ruled off the earth. There will be no more left on the earth. And uh, Materia Medica will get the greatest part of the credit for that because it will come through Materia Medica. Materia Medica is the second god of the world. Money is its first, and Materia Medica is its second, especially in and through the control of the American Medical Association that seems to have even legislatures and almost Congress within its grasp. Now, as Materia Medica adopts more and more of the uh, metaphysical approach to healing, there will of course be less and less of disease on earth until in the end it will be ruled off. Now, I have led up to this point, that the body in and of itself cannot have or cannot contract a disease. It is utterly fantastic to believe that the body has enough intelligence to know or has any intelligence whatsoever. Remove mind from the body, remove consciousness, and of course you have no ability to be well or to be sick. The body is a reflector, and it's a reflector of the state of consciousness of the individual, and that is why if uh, your state of consciousness is sufficiently materialistic, you can receive great, great benefit through material means. If your uh, state of consciousness leans more to the intellectual or the mental, you can derive great benefits 
through a mental approach to life and health and harmony. If, on the other hand, your consciousness rises to the spiritual, you will find that both the physical and the mental are subject to your spiritual consciousness. Now, on the mental level, you will find that your body is subject to your mental consciousness. In other words, on that level we are told that things are thoughts. No, thoughts are things, excuse me. Thoughts are things, and thoughts have a tendency to become things. And on that level, the thoughts that we entertain and hold in mind have a tendency to manifest themselves on the body. It isn't difficult, of course I know that many of you already know this because of your years of study in uh, the metaphysical world, you know how completely the body is subject to the mind. You have seen it in many healings. You have witnessed it over and over and over again that your body is subject to the knowing, the mental activity of your practitioner, that your body responds to the mental knowing of your practitioner, even if your practitioner is 3,000 miles away. The practitioner knows the truth and your body responds. Everyone who has had an experience of metaphysical healing knows that that is true. And of course, we're not going to, at this date, try to establish that metaphysical healing exists. That is uh, proven to too great a degree to even take time with. But it is important to know how the healing takes place, and it is because the body, even on the physical level, is subject to the mind, and the mind can control the body. Of course, you know that even leaving out a religious teaching even leaving out the subject of God or the Spirit of Christ. You know right well that there have been uh, people with various degrees of paralysis who through sheer willpower have overcome it and become healthy. There are people who have had serious diseases of many kinds and through sheer determination and the will to live have survived. That in itself would be enough to show the power of the mind over the body. As you rise into the spiritual, you will find not only that the body responds to the spirit, but that the mind responds to the spirit. And probably the greatest evidence of that or example of it is in this. Assuming that a person is the victim of some type of wrong thinking. Let us say that a person is overly sensual or let us say that a person is uh, lacking in uh, ordinary integrity, the type of individual who might lie, cheat, chisel. The moment the spirit touches the consciousness of that individual, that type of thinking completely disappears out of them, and we have what is called reformation. Now, it is an impossibility for a person 
who is sensual to correct it by trying uh, to be not sensual. It just is not possible. It cannot be done. Repression, yes. These things can be repressed to a certain point, usually they explode, or they may be kept under control. But a person who is sensual will not lose that sensuality merely through trying to exchange one type of thought for another. They may be able to deflect it for a while, not overcome it. The overcoming of it is when the spirit itself touches that individual's thought and dissolves or removes that state of mind we will call sensuality. In the same way, a person may be a materialist, and they may evidence that in uh, a greed for money or a lust for power. acquisition, miserliness. For that person to attempt to overcome it just by some other form of thinking hasn't worked and won't work. Again, there might be some improvement in it and there may be a repression of it or a deflection of it. The healing will only come when spirit when a state of consciousness that we in this work call Christ consciousness touches that individual, it can uh, change the whole nature of the person. Now, in the healing work itself, we make use of terms that must be understood And for that purpose, we have two major words. And be very careful that you understand the meaning of them, because they will be important in uh, whatever healing work you undertake, whether for yourself or your family or publicly professionally. The words are real and unreal, or reality and unreality. Probably more fun is poked at metaphysics because of uh, the word unreal or unreality than any other. Perhaps more ridicule is brought to it. Because in metaphysics we are so apt to say it is unreal or it is untrue two cars smash up in front and uh, scattered all over the scenery and the metaphysician comes along and says it's unreal it isn't true never happened you can't blame the world not knowing the meaning of the word untrue unreal from ridiculing it and the sad part is that very often the metaphysician using the words do not understand the meaning of it and for that reason are not able to bring out the healing that would come through the proper use or understanding of those words. In our work, the word real or reality pertains only to that which is spiritual, eternal, immortal, infinite. Only that which is of God is called real or reality. And now be sure of this, you cannot see, hear, taste, touch, or smell reality. And there your metaphysician makes his mistake as a rule when he sees a healthy person or what we call a good person or moral person or a normal healthy harmonious situation he's apt to think of that as real and uh, when he sees the sick or the sinning 
to call that unreal. And actually, that never has been the true meaning of these words. Reality pertains only that to that which is spiritual as our spirit, soul, God, and therefore must be spiritually discerned, spiritually understood. It requires the faculty of soul to behold reality. We'll come back to that. The unreal or unreality is anything, whether to our sense harmonious or inharmonious, that is not permanent, that is not God-governed, God-maintained, and God-sustained. Now, a healthy person may not necessarily be reality, because if they have a state of health that can change tomorrow and become ill health, there's no more reality about the good health than uh, about the bad health. If you can see, hear, taste, touch, and smell it, it is not a part of reality. Regardless of how good or harmonious or fine it may be, reality pertains only to that which is discerned through the inner awareness. Jesus referred to this in uh, such terms as, do you have ears and do not hear? Having eyes, you do not see. In other words, there is that which must be seen and heard with the soul faculties, with the inner consciousness, with uh, one's inner spiritual development. There are those, and always have been some, who come to this earth spiritually illumined and with the ability to perceive some measure of reality. They have been the mystics who have been mystics almost from birth. There are others who attain this consciousness sometime later in life. According to the cases investigated by Dr. Buck and which are to be found in the book Cosmic Consciousness, those who attain this illumination after birth usually attain it between their 35th and 40th year. Why that should be, I have no knowledge. All I know is that on the cases, even those that we know outside of Dr. Buck's investigation, it usually happens that way somewhere between 35 and 40 years of age. Now, this spiritual discernment, or the ability to understand reality, is not reserved for those who have had mystical illumination. It is possible to take almost anyone, almost anyone, who is willing to be a student of spiritual truth and uh, in some period of time bring them to a measure of that spiritual discernment. Now there are those who achieve it in one day. There are those who achieve it in a few weeks or a few months, and others who 
work with it for a year or two or three. Of course, one uh, deciding factor in uh, the length of time is uh, the degree of the desire for that awareness. In other words, it isn't to be gotten for one spare change and in one spare time. It doesn't come that way. There must be as more devotion to it than there would be to learning a new language or a new or playing another musical instrument. There must be a desire of the heart. Given that, the willingness to study and practice it is only a matter of a very short time when anyone can achieve some measure of it and show it forth in actual healing work. Now I know very little of uh, how this was accomplished by uh, Mrs. Fillmore of Unity, I know very little of that, but I do know that the two women who are credited with greater success in that work than any others of the modern age were able to accomplish it with people in a week and two weeks time. And that was Mrs. Eddy and Mrs. What's your name? The teacher of teachers, you know, some of you know, huh? Hopkins, Emma Curtis Hopkins. Miss Reddy and Emma Curtis Hopkins were two women who had the faculty of opening people that quickly. Some of them in just a few days and many of them in a few weeks. What any other records are, I don't know. I am acquainted with the work of those two women, and it was remarkable the way they could open a person and make healers of them in a very, very short time. Of course, <clears throat> the great need is illumination on the part of the teacher, and then, as I say, the student who is willing, really, to put themselves into it. And uh, the method of it comes about through the understanding of this word reality and of course unreality. Starting with the word God and remembering that the word God itself may not mean much to you, those letters, G-O-D, have very little meaning, actual meaning for most people, but there is always a synonym for the word God that brings God more clearly to one's understanding. Some of you may grasp God as the divine mind or universal mind or universal consciousness or universal life or cosmic consciousness. Some of you may understand God better as law or principle. God is the creative principle of the universe. That shouldn't be difficult for anyone to understand that nothing can be created without a creative principle. In other words, there can be no such thing as an effect 
without a causative uh, law or principle. And to understand God in that way is not difficult. But scripture gives many synonyms for God. It gives God as truth, as life, as law, as love, as substance, as cause, probably more. And out of those, you can catch one synonym at least that will make God more real to you. Now there we have the use of the word real in its true sense. When you can make God real to you, you have a glimpse of reality. You've glimpsed reality the moment God in some measure becomes real to you. As long as God remains just a word, a word in a book, or a word in your mouth, with no meaning, you have no understanding of the subject. It is like our use of the word Stalin or the word communism today. It means so little, and that little probably not correct, that it can be said that we have no real understanding of the man or the subject. But to grasp some sense of these as to make them real and understandable uh, makes them more real to you. Go back to God. If God is just a word and if life, truth, love, soul, spirit, principle, law are just words to you, God is not real. And you have no grasp of reality. But if you can take one or more of the synonyms, and uh, bring yourself to a point on the subject of God where you can say, Oh, I see. Oh, I understand. Oh, now I know. Now God has become real, you have grasped some measure of reality. The moment that happens, you are ready just with that for the healing work. Because if you can grasp the reality of God, you have already grasped the reality of God's creation, which would include man, the body, the universe, and spiritual law. Since God includes all of these, the uh, understanding of the greater would include the lesser. Now, the first point in our healing ministry must be some measure, or oh, a grain is enough, a tiny, tiny little bit, of a grasp of the nature of God, of the meaning of God, so that God becomes real, and then uh, you will understand that you have witnessed the reality of that which is intangible to the senses, that which cannot be seen, heard, tasted, touched, or smelled. You have touched the transcendental and the mystical side of life. The moment you have one tiny grain of understanding of God, the moment God has in any degree become real to you, you have witnessed reality or the spiritual universe, and that would include its creation and its law. Now, 
It is for that purpose that when we speak of sin or disease as unreal or unrealities, we do not mean non-existent. We do not mean that uh, we're just fooling ourselves or using our imagination in saying it's unreal or untrue. It is not a denial of the so-called existence of these things. It is a denial of their existence as a part of God or reality. Do you see the difference in that? Never, never use such terms as, oh, it's unreal, or it's untrue, or it, it never happened, unless you understand that it's unreal and it's untrue and it never happened in the, the spiritual kingdom, in the realization or consciousness of God. Now then, with that distinction in mind, you can accept this premise of metaphysical and uh, spiritual healing ministries that all sin, disease, lack, limitation are unreal. They are no part of reality. When you sit back in uh, your meditation and you are contemplating God and you have even the slightest touch, you find that there isn't a trace there of sin or sinful desire or sinful thought or criticism, judgment, condemnation, fault finding. There isn't a thing there but love. Love. You're completely enveloped in love. And it's only natural that from then on as you live your human life, the loving part of you becomes more and more uh, to the front and uh, that part of you which has been turned mortal that is the sinful the critical the condemnatory the judging the impatient the impure that tends to fall away bit by bit and uh, we hope to witness the day when it becomes so totally unreal that it never enters our consciousness again. The Master was enabled, I speak of the Master, Christ Jesus, was enabled to see this unreality of power, evil power, unreality of uh, sin, as shown forth in his statement, in his answer to Pilate, when Pilate said, I have power to crucify you or set you free, and of course he did have that temporal power, you know, he was the ruler. The master could answer, Thou couldst have no power over me except it come from the Father. Now, he understood the temporal power that Pilate had, but he knew that in his own consciousness of reality, temporal power could not be exercised, temporal power could not express. And then, when he was arrested, and uh, instead of resisting, He even healed the soldier whose ear had been cut off by Peter. Put up thy sword. Later, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. He was seeing through their human activity and seeing it as unreal. That is not a part of power, not a part of the eternal, the immortal, and the forever lasting. It was that 
that enabled him to come forth from the tomb. The fact that there was no power in the crucifixion. It was that which enabled him to heal the sick. The same thing that enabled us to be going to avoid the subject. It should surprise everyone that ministers, rabbis, and priests are not doing spiritual healing work, since there can be no question that the vast, vast majority of all ministers, rabbis, and priests are honest, sincere students of God, lovers of God, seekers of God, and uh, in a great measure live their lives close to God, at least as close to God as uh, their understanding permits, and that's great. Now, if God, as usually understood, were a healer of disease, why is it that in these hundreds of years since the Bible has been in existence, that our ministers and rabbis and priests do not have a monopoly on spiritual healing. Their lives are lived for God. There's no question about that. I'm speaking now of the 90-odd percent of all the ministers and priests and rabbis in the world. Their lives are lived for God. Their lives are dedicated to service to the service of God and of man. They are earnest, they are honest, they are sincere. They are students of the Bible. Why are they not doing spiritual healing work? The answer is this. Every religious teaching on the face of the earth, with the exception of metaphysical teaching, accepts disease as much of a reality as health. It accepts an evil power in the world equally with the power of good and uh, probably in most cases gives more power to evil than to good. As a matter of fact, very little power is given to God by the church until after death. I think that was brought out in a series of articles in Collier's Magazine. There were four articles in the series, and uh, the question was asked, why we are not able in this age to have the benefit of God in our lives, that is, in the prevention of war, in the stopping of war, in the prevention of disease or healing of disease and other human calamities, and uh, the almost unanimous opinion of the priests, rabbis, and uh, ministers was that the power of God is not for this world, but after death. In this world, you take care of yourself. That's on record in a magazine. And of course, if there were any other answer, they would have it, but they haven't. Only through the revelation of metaphysical teaching do we know why they are not healing. Now this you might be interested in knowing, that the Episcopal Church, in some of its branches, has accepted spiritual healing, and they have ministers conducting regular healing services and uh, doing healing work. Those ministers, for the most part, learned their healing art from science and health. The Episcopal Church of South Africa officially has adopted spiritual healing, but it has adopted the infinite way 
as its textbook for teaching its ministers how to heal. And there are in uh, the States several churches now uh, conducting healing meetings and using the infinite way and probably uh, others using other books. Oh yes, in, uh, in Denver there is an Episcopal church whose minister is Dr. Russell and he is a graduate of the Science of Mind, the Institute of Religious, Institute of Los Angeles, and he is one of its licensed and authorized practitioners and teachers. And he conducts a healing ministry in his Episcopal Church in Denver. Now, the reason that the clergy cannot heal, unless they have been taught through metaphysical work, is this. They accept the existence of disease and the premise that they can pray to God to remove it. And it can't be done. If God could remove disease, you wouldn't have to sit around waiting to pray for it. God would do it long before you could pray for it. It isn't a God somewhere that can heal disease and won't, or that God waited all these thousands of years until Jesus came along to start a healing ministry, and then for 2,000 years dropped it all of a sudden and waited for Mrs. Eddy to come along. What kind of a horrible God would we have if God could heal disease and didn't do it until Jesus Christ came along and then stopped it after Jesus Christ until Mrs. Eddy came along. Oh, let's, let's go deeper into this subject of healing and understand that, that healing is not based on any such premise as a disease and a God that can heal it, but a certain man or woman or group of men and women must come along to uh, bring God into the picture and gain God's goodwill. Oh no, there's no such thing. There is no such thing. In the kingdom of God, there is no disease. God maintains and sustains its kingdom intact, harmonious, helpful, complete, perfect, spiritual, and whole. There is no defect in God's kingdom. God has not given this world disease. If God had given this world disease, Jesus is the major sinner on earth for having thwarted God by healing it. God has never decreed death, or Jesus is the world's greatest sinner for having thwarted God's will by raising from the dead. Oh no. Jesus the Christ and others like him have been ministers of God, have been disciples of God, have been the instruments of God in revealing to the world that disease, sin, death is no part of God's kingdom, is not real, and cannot stand in the face of that understanding. Let this be clear to you. The moment you touch the hem of the spiritual robe, you will behold that in the entire kingdom of heaven there is not a sinner. There is no disease. Who did sin? This man or his parents? Neither. Did this woman take an adultery sin? Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. No, no. As you touch the hem of the robe, as you catch this first inner light, the first thing you will witness is the fact that in all of God's kingdom there is no sin, no disease, no death, no lack, no limitation, and you will no longer experience it on your human plane, or rather you will experience it less in proportion as this inner light 
grows greater. Now, instead of appealing to God for healing work, instead of turning to God in the hope that we can bring God's power to this poor, suffering sinner or sick one, let us honor God in the realization that the spiritual kingdom is intact and that this that comes to our attention in the form of sin, disease, death, lack, or limitation is no part of reality, no part of that kingdom of God, and therefore has no witness, cannot stand, has no substance or law. Now we come to more terms in the healing work. In dealing, you will follow this in my writings, especially as you make a careful study of all of the chapters entitled 